Welcome back to the Pursuit Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about software testing and sort of testing in general. I'm your host, Jessica Rose, and today I'm here with Richard Bradshaw. Richard, what do you do? I am currently the boss boss at Ministry of Testing, but generally just a bit of a software testing enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to dig a little bit into this title, boss boss. Is that what it says on your business cards? It is. Yeah. Is Everyone it? at Ministry of Testing is a boss. So if you're the person who leads all the bosses, then we came up with boss boss. Not mega boss or final boss. No, nah, that could work. But no, nah, it's it before my time. So Rosie, who started the company, came up with it. So I just took it over. So yeah, I'm boss boss. I'm going to assume there was some kind of epic boss fight to transfer over the title. <laughs> Uh, there was more trying to come up with a title for her, actually. That was the hardest bit. <laughs> Super secret boss. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things you can go with that. There is a lot of things you can do. And the Ministry of Test, this is very clearly a League of Supervillains. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, you're the boss boss of the Ministry of Testing. There's an underwater castle, right? Some government secret agency in the world of testing. I love how we've gone even more evil. You're like, wait, wait, we're not supervillains. We're government. <laughs> Well, most people think government, they think Ministry of Defence, they're all usually government named these ministry things. But no, we're nothing to do with that, we're cool and trendy. <laughs> so our far dear listener remembers nothing else, it's the Ministry of Testing, and that Richard specifically is cool and trendy. Maybe. <laughs> I'll let you decide. <laughs> <laughs> so we've do- dove into a bit of what the Ministry of Testing is, and what, what on earth are you? Well, not you specifically, but... You would think I would know this, but it's one of the hardest questions to answer. We basically call ourselves a community of practice. So we're a community where everything we do is to try and get people interested in software testing, software quality, talking to each other. It's pretty easy as the way of describing it. We've got conferences around the world, meetups around the world, Slack channels, forums, blog feeds, online learning platform, and I could go on. <laughs> We just try and keep innovative ways for you all to learn and share your knowledge around testing. So yeah, usually towards the end of these podcasts, we try and like really sell people on what our guest is talking about and then give them opportunities to find ways to learn more. But you're, you're, you're getting that right out in the beginning. In the first couple (laughs) of minutes, you're saying, Hey, go to ministry of testing. We'll teach you cool things. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I won't teach you cool things. The platform will connect you with awesome people who will teach you cool things. Oh, that's even easier. Yeah, we like I said, we're community driven. Everything we do is we provide the platform and the members of the community utilize it to share their knowledge. And then we try and financially reward people for their time. That sounds roundly decent. Are you sure you all are doing that in 2019? Because everything's not great now and that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we are. Yeah, we're, we're completely <laughs> bootstrapped and like we... I didn't yeah, mean to not... come in and be like, are you sure? Because that sounds really ethical and solid, but like, cool. I... That's pretty much what we're known for. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, and I wasn't trying to imply that you all were horrible, just that the larger world we exist in is horrible. Yes, but you, you make a very good point. <laughs> Uh, For our dear listeners, I should point out that both of us are based in the UK, where stuff is absolutely fine at the moment. (laughs) I've just got the picture of that gif in my head of the girls on the swing (laughs) while the buildings are on fire in the background. (laughs) Anyway, tell your friends, tell investors, everything in the UK is just fine at the moment and expected to stay totally normal through 2020 from my understanding. Oh yeah, absolutely no change at all. So it sounds like part of what you do is help support and manage this community and also sort of evangelize the, oh, do we like the word evangelize? Yeah, why not? All right. Evangelize the idea of, hey, here are these testing duties, here are these testing responsibilities, maybe even the, here are these test roles you could be doing here's why you should get excited about this. Do you have like an elevator pitch? Like, hey, let me tell you kids why testing is cool. (laughs) So just for context then for listeners, I spent 12 years testing and I I must admit, I do think it is cool. It's like, for me, it's constant learning. The goal of testing for me is to discover useful information that the team can use. So I just spend my days looking for interesting pieces of information, utilizing tools and models and thinking to try and gather it. So it's always different. It's never the same, which a lot of people think testing is always the same. <laughs> but if done well, it shouldn't be. So your, your first pitch is 
testing. It's not just repetitive clicking. Oh, yeah, obviously that's what people think. Perhaps, you know, in people's defence, a lot of testing was done like that in the past. So the pitch more completely is testing. It doesn't suck anymore. (laughs) I can see where you're going with this. Um, (laughs) It never did suck. People just weren't doing it right. (laughs) Testing, you were doing it wrong the whole time and it's cool. Exactly that. Please remind me never to get into a job where I write elevator pitches. <laughs> I never take the elevator anymore. I'm trying to be healthy. Take the stairs. <laughs> we, let's do a stair pitch instead where we sort of walk through this in a bit more detail. We'll get there one step at a time. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like we've slowly committed into writing a startup book now. Like we've, we've got the basic <laughs> premise. Uh, oh, no. So let's let's walk through this a little bit. Let's Let's start taking those stairs. Sure. I'm a software engineer or I'm reasonably technically minded. Maybe I'm a software enthusiast and I'm not doing a lot of testing now. Maybe I know I should, but how do you get started? If I'm writing some software and I'm not really doing a lot of testing right now, what kind of carrot or stick would we best approach hypothetical me with? My first stance would be, I think every software engineer does testing. They just might not call it testing. Oh, I've not met any engineer who doesn't test. Like they might write a few lines of code and see if it compiles. Like they might not call that testing, but you're trying to get a piece of information. You might run it locally just to do a few checks that the server comes up. It's not like massively in-depth testing, but they will be trying things to discover information. So I would start by identifying how they work and then trying to spot opportunities to give them a few hints and tips about how to add a bit more testing into the mix. I, I like that pitch. Testing, you're doing it already, get credit for it. Yeah, everyone does. Like Again, it's probably a bit of the term. Like People think it is this boring, repetitive, don't need skills to do it. So people don't like to say that I'm doing it. But every engineer, to some degree, definitely tests. Uh, and I'm afraid I'm going to expose my own ignorance to what sounds like may be a common misconception in testing. Do people genuinely think that it's less skilled or easy? Yeah, definitely. You mentioned it, clicking buttons. There's always been things in the past about monkeys can test it, uh, anyone can do it. So yeah, there has been a notion. It is dying, but there has been, especially early in my career, that anyone can test. Uh, You just need to read the spec and type the keyboard. (laughs) Was this a bit like maybe nine-year-old me was like, riding a bike is easy, but dumb. I don't need to do it. I could if I wanted to. Is it one of these kinds of things? I'm not sure. I just think people didn't give it, it's like a second citizen. Everyone was all about the building of the software, not necessarily how it worked. You'll hear that a lot of testers, I'm not saying this is a bad path, but a lot of testers, you kind of fall into testing. Very few people set out saying, I'm going to go be a software tester, whereas people do say, I want to go be a software developer. So it hasn't quite always had the credit it deserves. It is an incredibly hard thing to do well. And this might be a good thing to touch on because I understand, and talking to learners and talking to people entering software and entering engineering, a lot of folks do either take a step along the way where they do some testing or they explicitly enter a test role for some time and then move on to other engineering roles. Is this a pathway that you're seeing a lot of people in your community using as well? Yeah, definitely. I think there's a massive, there's so many paths to go down these days. There's people in our community that have moved heavy into the DevOps space and focusing more on pipelines. And there's a new wave of people moving into the observability space. Because again, it's collecting information. You're just collecting it from production and trying to make sense of it. Or the tooling is telling you to come and have a look over here. So then obviously you use your testing skills to go and have a look over there. Obviously automation is playing a huge role. So a lot of people are getting their dev fix by writing lots of automated checks. But there is also another wave of people getting involved a lot earlier in the process and using these testing skills before we've even written a line of code or even written a single story. A lot of testers have very good critical thinking skills. So yeah, there's a whole host of paths to go down now. Oh, quality engineering is a popular term. There's a lot of people moving into coaching roles. So yeah, it's becoming a very diverse space. Uh, so let's say hypothetically, our dear listener, well, not not you, dear listener, but another dear listener who could benefit from this, is brand new to tech. Maybe they're looking to get into software engineering or looking at the ear engineering space in general. 
And this might be one of the first times they've heard about sort of explicit roles in test. What kinds of things are out there for them? Well, the most popular at the moment would probably be like the SEDET, the Software Developer Engineering Test. And obviously that's like a combination of spending a lot of your time doing exploratory testing, but a larger chunk of your time creating automated checks, automated tests. And that's certainly one that's quite popular in a lot of bigger companies now, let's say, or more advanced companies, this role of a quality engineer that's growing in, it's a more of a coaching supportive role. So the developers are still doing most of the testing, but they're being guided by this quality engineer and the quality engineer role stretches right from before stories are even written all the way to the things in production. And is it providing any value? So almost a kind of quality boss. Yeah, yeah. If we keep the boss titles, yeah. Like it's, it's really funny. We've kind of gone full circles in testing. We used to have quality assurance and it's a term that you would find a lot of testers in our community don't like because it's impossible for me to assure quality. And I can't do that as an individual. I saw it more as sort of reassuring the folks building stuff and reassuring the team. Be like, they're there. We're all trying. Let's keep trying. <laughs> That's a good way of doing it. But usually it ended up with the tester getting the blame, saying, you know, why did you miss this? Why did you miss that, et cetera? Uh, again, times are changing, though. We don't tend to have too much of that. Um, but yeah, I like your idea of it better. But now it's kind of gone full circle and we were respected enough to be able to go and mention things that could improve quality all along the way instead of being this team at the end that try and test the quality in, which never works. <laughs> so let's say hypothetically, we're deep in the hypotheticals here. I'm that same dear listener who is interested in getting into engineering. I love your pitch of being a test boss. And maybe I want to explore this. Maybe I want to get into it. Maybe I want to become a test engineer. What kinds of skills would I need or could I need before I start practically looking at applying for my first job? Like problem solving is the number one testing skill. Well, maybe that's not number one. There's probably a few in that top row, but problem solving skills are a must because that is literally what testing is. You, you've, you know, everyone listening to this is involved in software in some way. We're trying to solve problems all the time. Our users, customers want to be able to do A. We attempt to build something that solves A. And then we're, when we're testing it, we're trying to work out if we've successfully built A and it works and provides the customers with what they want. So being able to identify those problems and break them down is, is a must. But again, that skill transfers across every software role. Critical thinking is definitely a fascinating space to look into. You always get the, the famous testing quote, you know, no user's going to do that or... <laughs> how, how the hell did you think to do that? And obviously, I think they come from critical thinking skills. Yeah, nine times out of ten, when I find hear about really interesting ones in the news, they tend to be, oh, someone put an emoji in this field. Yeah, definitely. There's a guy who I know, um, Lee Rathbone, he put an emoji in some of the early MMS oh. systems. Oh, it might have been some, yeah, it was something, definitely something emoji-based, and he managed to bring down one of the big telecom networks. <laughs> so just with an emoji. Oh, fantastic. I think one of the banks had a similar issue uh, last year. It doesn't surprise me, like emojis. This is where the critical thinking side of it, I've had that happen so many times that I have heuristics in my head that just say, try an emoji, try Unicode, try random characters, try different languages. It's a text field. Somebody's going to put something exciting in it. Oh, definitely. Yeah. They're going to put random characters. They're going to try and put 5,000 characters. People are going to do it. Because, you know, they can. <laughs> so if you can, why not? Uh, so it sounds like user empathy and sometimes user empathy in a, in a gently competitive way is a big part of these roles. Yeah, definitely. I think being able to observe users or think as a user, you know, what is a user want to do? We tend to focus on software a lot from a very functional aspect. Like, you know, it says that I should be able to pay for this and like, well, I built it and you can pay for it, but the journey was horrible. That isn't going to help your users use your system, which isn't going to generate your revenue or your business growth. So we have to focus on obviously being functional, but also nice to use. That's where the testing fun kind of, we get to spread across this whole role. We're not just about, does it functionally work? We want to talk to the users. We want to find out how they're using it. We want to observe how they're using it. Honestly, is it's such an awesome space to be in because you get to do a bit of everything. 
I, I confess that I think you might be a much nicer person than I am. I was approaching this from a very competitive, like, yeah, let's figure out what those glorious weirdos are going to do. <laughs> yes, for our listeners as well, I count all of us as, as glorious weirdos as well. It's not just users. But the way you framed it sounds a lot less competitive and a lot more yeah, kind and interesting. So, wow, how can we make sure that the things that we're building are not just beautiful and not just useful from a ticks the box, but like genuinely work for the way people need to use them. Yeah. And this, again, they could list billions of things that focus on that space, but you've got accessibility, which is obviously a huge criteria. You've got to know who your target users are, what kind of demographic are they or what age groups are they in? And obviously you can try and guess all that up front, but it's much easier to try and find out somehow, yeah. you know, record it have observability, have monitoring in place to try and get this. Because I could sit there designing personas all day long and that might not be a good use of my time. Or I could just go and find out who the hell is using this app and how are they using it and make sure that we test to keep those people using it. So this is really interesting and abstract, but let's talk a bit more practically. If I say, well, I'm going to go out and find out who's using this app and how they're using it. How might I do that? Or how might you do that? I mean, some of the apps I've done, you know, you can put in libraries. Uh, we used to use Crashalytics, but I think that's gone now. But that used to give us a lot of information about their devices and locations. But also, it depends on your context and your company, but you can get a lot of information about your users if your company happens to record it. And then it's just asking these questions. People will know who they're trying to target, so like product owners. They come to us with their features, but they would have had a lot of conversations prior to that. So it's asking them specific questions to get that information out of them, which then can lead us to influence the way we go about testing the software. So yeah, asking a lot of questions. So you mentioned the skills earlier. Asking good questions is like really high up there in the testing world. <laughs> oh, great. So if anyone out there was that really smart, gently annoying kid at school, it was like, <laughs> But what about this? What about this? It sounds like that they may have a budding career in test engineering just waiting to happen. Yeah. And then the second most important skill then is knowing when to stop asking some of those questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, like the five whys is quite a popular one. Just keep asking why. But I think once you get to number five, the other person's just had enough. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like stop it. That's cute. We're, we're done with whys now. <laughs> exactly. So we've talked a bit about what kinds of skills and what kinds of personalities and what kinds of approaches might be a really great fit for folks coming into testing. What are some challenges you see folks coming into testing for the first time or coming into testing roles face? It's definitely just the pace of software, but I don't think it's unique to testers. It's the landscape of building software is moving at such a rapid pace that obviously if you want to test software, you need to be on top of all these things. Perhaps you don't need to know how to go and set up something in AWS, but you need to understand the implications of using something like AWS. You might not have to know all the latest cool packages that are out there, but you need to understand how they're built and where they're coming from and is there any security holes in that. You need to understand all the monitoring and observability tools. So it's all everything that can make up a piece of software you need to get on top of. And it's, it's a lot of work. Or you can just be the tester at the end who just checks that the requirement has been built. Oh. They won't have a very long career in the way that things are shifting. So it is that thirst for knowledge, that desire to not know everything inside and out because we're not building a lot of these features, but having enough knowledge about them so that we can think about how to test it or how it might impact the product that we're building. But this sounds like a really fantastic opportunity as well, sort of the long-term ability to dig into these new technologies, to pick up these new skills. This might be me being a bit of a cynic, or maybe it's just the way the world works now, or maybe just roles in tech. But from my experience, folks tend to stay in roles in technology not quite as long as we might expect people to in different industries. Oftentimes, you'll see folks change jobs every two or three or four or even one year. It sounds like some of the challenges you've just mentioned are also really exciting opportunities to pick up these new skills and maybe move on to your next job. Hopefully still in testing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. There is, there's so many opportunities in testing, but like even in the world, software is just everywhere. I think it was the CEO of General Motors who was at an announcement at, I think at Davos, that big conference in Switzerland. And they said that we're now a software company. We're no longer an engineering company. And every company's taking that route. 
So yeah, there's so many opportunities out there in the world of software. It's an incredibly exciting domain to be in. I think everyone who works in this domain is just so privileged and so lucky to, to that software became what it is. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, talking about like, oh, people move into ops roles or this or that. Uh, just to dash back a little bit, what kinds of roles are you often seeing community members move into once they've gotten or or taking their uh, test experience to? So like I mentioned it briefly, like automation is a massive space at the moment. Everyone wants to be faster and releasing quicker and getting that rapid feedback. So a lot of testers, I don't like to use the term, but the listeners will relate to it. We have notion of what we call manual testers. I don't call them that, but the industry calls them manual testers and they're the people just running through test scripts or test cases, or just usually they spend a lot of their time exploratory testing. A lot of those people are moving into the world of automation because we can't realistically in this world of software context has changed, but we can't have someone sat there running test cases for days, weeks, months, because the opportunity for that business has gone. So we need to find new ways of getting that rapid feedback and automation is one of them at the moment. So there's a lot of people really wanting to move into the automation space. Very exciting. It is, yeah. And that's, that's another minefield. That's basically being a software engineer. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of building products, you're building products to test the products. It's just products all the way down, eh? It is. It is products all the way down. So we've absolutely sold someone out there today. Oh, wow, I want to do more testing or I want to get into testing or possibly they only really paid attention for the first couple of minutes and they're like, I want to be a super villain. <laughs> um, I don't think the I want to work for the British government is going to be a, a massive sell right right just now. Uh, oh, I, I guess there's a couple of folks vying for a government job right now. Probably there's plenty of them going around. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for our dear listeners who are not based in the UK, there's currently a two guys competing to see if they get to be prime minister, but maybe not. That That's accurate? Pretty accurate, yeah. There's extra dependencies and clauses, but poof, um, everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say we've completely conned, uh, uh, convinced, convinced. Uh, someone to rededicate their life to testing or even to just to check it out a little more. Where would you recommend they start looking for information first? So you're absolutely right, Jess. And what I actually think will happen is they won't have a choice. Oh, Software engineers are going to have to get more involved in testing because that's the direction we're going. There's going to be less dedicated testers. Uh, and a lot more of the kind of roles we've mentioned, people specializing in automation or quality engineers or coaches who are trying to help the developers get more involved in the testing space and having that team own the quality. And I think it's rightly so. Like if I've said I've built a piece of software that can do ABC, I would want to make sure that it can do ABC. <laughs> I don't want to ship it or put it over some wall to someone else to come back and tell me that it can't do ABC. I want to own my work. And saying, I built this, it's probably fine. Doesn't sound super satisfying. It doesn't, does it? Like, would you be sat at your desk going, I've done a really good job today? Whereas if you've been able to run it yourself, do a little bit of exploratory testing, maybe write some automated checks, automated tests for your the functionality that you've just written, and then you commit that knowing that I am, there's a guy called Michael Bolton, like, not the singer. <laughs> I was about to say, like, well, there is a guy named Michael Bolton. He's written a lot in the testing space, but he talks about knowing that it can work, not that it does work. Ooh. So the minimum developers should be doing is committing stuff to knowing that it can work. And then the team do other types of testing to find out if it does work. If that's the case, and I think that is where we're going Ministry of Testing has got loads of fantastic resources out there. We've got news feed, blog feed full of 800 blogs. There's fantastic books like Agile Testing by Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory. Ooh. And there's a fantastic book on exploratory testing called Explore It by Elizabeth Hendrickson. Um, so there is some great books out there. But yeah, just Twitter's a great place for testing community. There's lots of chat on there. There is so much information out there. The testing community is very vibrant. They're very open. They share a lot of what they do. So you just have to start looking for it. And yeah, Ministry of Testing and those books are a great start. So this is very, very wide open, really useful for folks just getting involved. What kind of development and testing or what kind of new technology you're seeing people use in it or what kind of approaches that are sort of new and novel are the most interesting for you? Or 
or is it unfair to ask the boss boss to like pick a favorite child? <laughs> I'm not sure if it's new and modern stuff. Like automation is rapidly changing. I make jokes about JavaScript, but there's a new fruit I'll drink out every week. The automation testing space seems to be on drinks at the moment. So there's a mocha and espresso and stuff like this. But we're starting to see the tooling be a lot more accessible on different layers of applications. A lot of applications now are being designed to be more testable. So therefore, we can get in at the API level. We can do unit testing. A lot of front-end applications now use some sort of JavaScript engine, so things like React. And we can now do lots of testing on the React layer. We can obviously still do our user-driven testing using things like Selenium on our UI. And we can now also even do visual testing. There's lots of tools out there that will do fancy image comparison for us. Five years ago, that was horrendous, right? You'd compare an image and it would say, this image is 99% the same as the other image. And you'd go, oh, that sounds okay. Um, but that 1% could be like your company logo. Um, I've seen issues <laughs> where it's the copyright, you know, the copyright ooh, still 2018, ooh, 2019. That's not acceptable. But now the tooling has got better. So a lot of testing that's out there now is predominantly done on the UI. And I think that's changing now. And that's awesome because these new frameworks are quicker, which means teams get rapid feedback, which is the main mission of testing. And we can start to be a bit more confident when it comes to releasing and the team has more information quickly to say, shall we ship this? Yeah, let's ship it. And I mean the team. I don't mean like one person coming along saying we should ship this. The team make that decision and decide to ship that piece of software. So yeah, the automation space is awesome. Lots of stuff there. But I actually think the exploratory testing side of it is coming back with a bang as well. Software has become really complicated. I think a lot of us may have noticed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, software has become increasingly complicated. We just seem to be, I, I, I don't know disrespect to software developers, but a lot of it's, to me, that I like the metaphor of plumbing. A lot of it is now just downloading packages left, right, and center and making them work. I'm not that old, but 10 years ago when I started, we used to rebuild a lot of things from scratch. Whereas now there's frameworks for everything and it's a case of just picking the right framework and getting it to talk to the other frameworks that you've chose. But those frameworks, we don't own them. So how do we know what they do? Do they have any flaws in them? Is there any bugs in them? Is there any security issues in them? So there's a lot more of this investigation skills that I think are coming back into the world of testing, well, into the world of software development. Testing and testers saving software from ourselves. Actually, I wouldn't say testers. I would stick to testing. Like I said, I think everyone's going to have to start wearing this hat. And you will have dedicated testers in certain contexts where they're needed. Obviously, there's lots of things that impact what we need to test. We, we call it testability. But in some contexts, you are going to need a dedicated tester, but in other ones, you might not need one. Or in some other roles, you might need perhaps a tester to come in every now and again when you, you're struggling to test. You can't work out how I'm going to test this piece of software, uh, which, funny enough, is actually my favorite piece of testing advice. <laughs> the best thing to ever ask in any meeting when you're talking about building something new is, how are we going to test this? Ooh. And there's a few things in that sentence that the we is massively important. I never asked the question of how am I going to test this as a team? How are we going to test this feature? And even before we've written anything, that opens up so many questions. Uh, and we can iron out a lot of bugs and a lot of design decisions there and then just by asking that very simple question. Fantastic. And it sounds like you're leaving us with some really practical, really sound advice. So approaching a new product, approaching a new feature, approaching a new approach. What should we ask? Yep. Yeah, how are we going to test this? How are we going to test this? And like pointed eye contact at everybody in the room, power pose, and then you just walk out? Pretty much, yeah. And then I come back and say, how are you going to test this? <laughs> <laughs> but it is massively important. Everyone's been in software and some software is just not testable. It's just not been designed to be. And that makes it hard. You can't achieve rapid feedback if it's not. So if you ask the question up front and you've got the team buying into this desire to have quality software, we can make design decisions there and then that make this thing easier for us to test. And once you ask that a couple of times, I, I, I bet actual money that you've got the teams asking, the rest of the team asking themselves, oh, how are we going to test this when they're approaching something new before they pitch oh, it? Definitely. It's one of the, some of my old teams just see the biggest grin on my face across the room. And it's because someone's just come out with, well, that's not going to be very testable. 
Ooh, nice. I've worked in an awesome team where I got to the point where the developers were listing what automated tests they were going to create as part of their work, as well as a list of exploratory charters, as in a charter is like a mission statement to do some testing. And the ticket before it had even been coded had all that information on it. And I was well happy. (laughs) It's the same thing about as people, as you mentioned, you start asking these questions, bringing up the same things over and over again, it becomes other people pick up those heuristics and we start to see a change in people's mindset around quality. So it just takes someone to ask those questions from the start, but you need to be in that room to be able to ask those questions. And sadly, not enough testing people are in the room at the moment. Let's get a lot more of you in a lot more rooms. Richard, you've been an absolute joy to chat to, and you've let us know several times that we can find the Ministry of Testing at ministryoftesting.com. But if folks wanted to hang out with you online in non-creepy, non-stalkery ways, where do you live on the internet? Yeah, so I'm everywhere. The easiest place is to get me on Twitter. So I'm a Matt Friendly Tester on Twitter. I'll reply pretty promptly there, and my DMs are open for now until I do get some of that creepy uh, DMs coming in. I, I um, until then. Yeah, I, I think most of our audience, I, I'd go as far to say everyone listening right now is absolutely lovely. And as long as you keep pictures of the puppy posted pretty regularly, nobody's going to hassle you. Oh, that sounded like a shakedown, didn't it? Whereas like you keep those dog pics coming. <laughs> yeah, no dog pics, no followers. <laughs> um, but yeah, Twitter's the best place. Ministry of Testing has got a big Slack channel. You, you can get me on there. I've uh, got a few YouTube channels, so whiteboard testing is little short, ten less than 10-minute videos on testing with my stood in front of my whiteboard, using that as a bit of a tool. Uh, and then I've just recently started doing some Twitches as well. Oh, um, how fun. Me, yeah, me and my colleague Mark are picking a new testing tool every couple of weeks and just spending an hour trying to make it do what it's meant to do. <laughs> um, helps us learn tools and keeps us fresh in terms of having, you know, more tools in our tool belt, but also it's a bit of fun. Depending on how careful you are, I'm sure that you you may introduce a global audience to some very northern swears. <laughs> yeah, well, he's from uh, Norfolk, so we kind of, oh, we, wow. we, we, we have a bit of banter about that. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you very much for listening. Come on back. We'll have a new episode for you soon. Until then, you can find us at Pursuit Pod on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you.